Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Annie. I'm one of the second year residents. Um, and I'm gonna start with my case presentation. So this is a, was a 21 year old male with history of high grade myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, status post stem cell transplant, ultimately ended up with graft versus host disease and requiring a bilateral lung transplant. He was admitted about a year ago for um, generalized tonic seizure. Um, in the weeks leading up to admission, he had about two to three weeks of low grade fevers, uh, some congestion, rhinorrhea and face, facial pain for which he was given a two week course of doxycycline for a presumed sinus infection, but did not have any improvement. And then the day prior to admission, he developed a headache. The um, seizure was witnessed by his mother, no prior history of seizures. He had rolled off the bed to the left side, hit his head on the nightstand and had about 30 seconds of bilateral upper extremity jerking with tongue bite. So his pertinent um, medical history, I already mentioned, these are his, uh, his medications at the time. Um, he was on Tacro, Atovaquone for prophylaxis and then uh, azathioprine and prednisone. His exam was, um, Remarkably unremarkable. Um, it was non-focal, no deficits. Um, and he had a pretty extensive um, laboratory workup by the time you were involved, had a, an LP um, with um, the typical studies and then um, some other studies as well, all of which were negative and unremarkable. Um, we were consulted uh, when his MRI brain was done showing these um, findings on the flare sequence. Um, <clears throat> pretty extensive and also had um, contrast enhancement in these lesions um, pretty much extensively throughout his brain, um, including cerebellum, brainstem, um, and basically his entire brain. Um, the contrast enhancement is a little bit difficult to see, um, but if you look, you can, um, they kind of, they correlate. I tried to get the same kind of slide here. Very small, like punctate areas of contrast enhancement, but they do correlate with these um, lesions seen on flare. So his hospital course, he pretty much had headaches that persisted and worsened throughout his admission. Um, he was inpatient for five or six days before we kind of had an idea of what was going on. Um, he didn't have any other seizures, um, but basically had this persistent headache. Um, ultimately got to the point, because everything was coming back negative, that he got a PET CT uh, that showed um, this left lower lobe opacity uh, that was PET avid, um, had had a normal chest x-ray, um, and then he had some hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy. Um, so the lung lesion was amenable to biopsy. They ended up biopsying that um, and the uh, culture ended up growing nocardia. Uh, it was pertinent for the silver positive filamentous structures. And then about one week into his admission, he worsened clinically. He had a rising white blood cell count um, and ended up having um, pretty much uh, altered level of consciousness concerning for um, herniation. And he did have an MRI that showed worsening burden of disease. And he had uh, both uncle and transtentorial herniation. Um, he was uh, transferred to the neuro ICU and started on Decadron and Manitol. Um, ultimately, he was treated with Bactrim and high dose IV ceftriaxone. Um, and was inpatient for about a month and a half. Um, and he was discharged on a long course of Bactrim with a slow taper. So in this case, uh, nocardia infection, gram positive bacteria, typically considered an opportunistic infection found throughout the world, usually in soil and acquired uh, via inhalation. Pretty common um, in transplant patients, and specifically in this patient, it's most common in um, lung and heart transplant patients in rates of 2.5 to 3.5%. Um, and the CNS disease occurs in about 20% of cases. Typical presentation is fever, headache, meningismus, seizures, and plus minus focal neurologic deficits, which he did not have initially. Um, 
and commonly involves the lungs, like I said, CNS and skin, um, but can also have eye involvement, heart valves, bones, joints, and kidneys. And here on the left is um, just another example MRI of the abscesses that can form with um, CNS nocardi nocardia infection. And then this is the bacteria itself. Um, just an update, he was ended up in the neuro ICU for several weeks. He had MRI brain in the interim that was worsening at the time that he was admitted to the neuro ICU. And then at the time of discharge, um, disease burden was improved. Um, like I said, this was a year ago. So he followed up an ID clinic recently um, and was doing well. No further headache or seizures. He's currently off AEDs um, and he has returned to work. He's still on Bactrim, but they're um, decreasing the dose. And those are my references and that's everything. Thank you, Annie. That's a wonderful. Um, okay, let me hit share. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Great. See, Rebecca, everybody at Duke, all patients do well. Uh, where is Rebecca? Rebecca, say something so your your picture will pop to the top. I'm I'm here. There you <laughs> you are. could also pin me. <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> a year and a half into this, and I've never pinned anybody. Uh, so it's a great day uh, to have Rebecca Gottesman uh, speaking to us today. Rebecca uh, got her MD at Columbia and a PhD at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. She was a neurology resident and did her stroke fellowship at Hopkins where I came to know Rebecca and quickly became a professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins for her work on dementia, stroke outcomes and vascular risk factors. But what I most remember Rebecca for is her years at Bayview, which is a uh, one of Johns Hopkins Hospital, there's a picture right there. And there's a, a picture of the group of us. Rebecca probably had just joined the faculty and there she is in the front row before she became big time. Uh, Rebecca's uh, research interests are vascular contributions to cognitive impairment, post-stroke impairment, small vessel disease. And as I wrote, she was a founding member of Bayview Neurology. But unfortunately, after years and years, uh, she, uh, Rebecca lived in Bethesda and commuted to, uh, to Baltimore to, to be at, at Bayview. And one of the reasons she was at Bayview was it was just one exit off of 95. So it was a, an easy commute, oh, easy commute from Bethesda. But Rebecca finally decided to stay in Bethesda permanently and you know get rid of the commute to Baltimore. And she's now the director of stroke at the uh, National Institute of Health in Bethesda, which was a, a brilliant choice on their part. Although we will, uh, we will, or we folks at Hopkins, I'm sure are gnashing their teeth at her, at her departure. So Rebecca is gonna talk to us today about a vexing issue about blood pressure and dementia, the highs, lows, and in-betweens. So Rebecca, I'll turn it to you. Thank you so much, Rich, for that very kind introduction. Um, what you didn't share um, is that part of the reason that I was at Bayview, in addition to it being one exit off the highway, is that there was a phenomenal leader there named Dr. Richard O'Brien, who um, invested in me very early in my career and convinced me that academia was hard, but it was worth it and made a tremendous difference in my, in my career. So it was a lot of fun back then, and it's delighted, I'm delighted to be here. Um, can everyone see my slides? Yep. Great. Um, so I, as Rich said, I'm going to talk a bit about um, both a vexing, but a very common issue um, that many people are either concerned about or perhaps should be concerned about, which is that of blood pressure and dementia, the highs, lows, and in-betweens. So here's my disclosure as a former associate editor. So just to, to give you a little bit of context about blood pressure in general. Um, certainly this is not, uh, I know this is a neurology audience and not a cardiology audience, but I think it's important to understand how we've defined high blood pressure, how that's changed, and therefore how that changes how we think about dementia and other 
uh, brain related outcomes. Um, so just to give you some context about blood pressure guidelines. So hypertension, although defined clinically early in the 20th century in the 1910s, really wasn't treated as an entity until post World War II. So FDR was a very famous patient who had hypertension, um, but went untreated for a number of years and his treatments were what we would consider not traditional certainly in this time. He was treated with phenobarbital massage therapy for blood pressure in the 180s systolic over 105 in 1941. At the Yalta conference in 1945, his blood pressure was 260 over 150 reportedly wasn't doing that well then in terms of health, um, not shockingly given that blood pressure, um, had heart failure, was drowsy, had poor health in general. And then in 1945, in April of 1945, he had a severe occipital headache. His blood pressure was 300 over 190 and he had an intracerebral hemorrhage. He may also have had metastatic melanoma, which could have contributed certainly to that hemorrhage, but the combination would, would certainly make things worse in terms of that bleeding. Um, this was some of the context of, of what was uh, available to the public about hypertension, but really treatment for hypertension started somewhat after that time and really more seriously started with a lot of medications being introduced. In terms of the guidelines for hypertension, the first report from the JNC, you guys have heard about the JNC recommendations, was in 1977, which really was focusing on diastolic blood pressure as the main target. As we moved through the JNC numbers, JNC7 was really the one that most people used for a long period of time to think about how we defined hypertension. So this was published in 2003, and really until a newer set of guidelines was published several years ago was the primary set of guidelines by which people were defined for their hypertension and by which management, management decisions were made. So JNC7, to remind people, said that normal blood pressure was below 120, Prehypertension was in this sort of 120 to 140 systolic range. Stage one hypertension started at 140 systolic and diastolic of 90. And then if your blood pressure was above 160 systolic, you were in the stage two hypertension range. There was a brief period where JNC8 came out, which was somewhat confusing given that it was more about who should get treated um, and really said you should only be treated if you're over 150 or a lower goal if you're um, diabetic or of, of chronic kidney disease. So there was a lot of controversy about JNC8. We're not gonna talk about that so much today, um, but to give you some context about these newer guidelines that came out in 2017, this was the Joint American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association set of guidelines. And I say new in quotes, it's new given that the previous major guidelines had been around since 2003. I realize these are several years old, but this shook things up quite a bit because suddenly there were a lot of people who had never been considered to be hypertensive who suddenly were. So the definition before, as I said, stage one started at 140. You can see here that now normal blood pressure is still less than 120 systolic, less than 80, elevated considered in the 120 to 130 range, and then above 130 now considered stage one hypertension. Um, stage two would be 140 or higher and a diastolic of 90 or higher. And, and actually just this year, an AHA scientific statement came out, which said, if you're in that stage one range, 130 to 139, 80 to 89 diastolic, you can start with lifestyle modifications, non-pharmacologic therapies, but really if it's been three to six months of no improvement, you might consider medication. So that's useful for people to understand what to do with these numbers. So when these new guidelines came out, this is an interesting publication, as I alluded to, lots of people suddenly had a new diagnosis of hypertension who never did, but probably more importantly, lots of people didn't know that they had a new diagnosis of hypertension by these new criteria. So the blue bars here are people that suddenly met new criteria for hypertension, but didn't before. So large proportions of the population, many millions of people, this is showing number of US adults in millions who suddenly meet new criteria for hypertension and might be recommended for treatment. This is an interesting paper that I was a part of actually looking at data from several large cohort studies, including the MESA study regards and the Jackson Heart study, which said how many of cardiovascular events that we see actually are under the 140 to 90 range. So in other words, if we only think about hypertension as above 140 to over 90, what's going on in these people below that? And again, this was because of this new set of guidelines that said 130 to 139 is now stage one hypertension. And interestingly, what you can see here, and I realize this is a busy slide, I don't want you to focus on the details, but is that this is basically showing you the 50% line for cardiovascular disease and stroke for overall and people on meds and not on meds, but everything is to the right of the line, which means that more than half of events 
in each of these subgroups by demographic features, cardiovascular versus stroke. This, this figure actually has four other panels with other types of outcomes. In every event, basically, more than half of the events in any subgroup are in people actually whose blood pressure is below 140 over 90. So really a meaningful part of the population, both in terms of prevalence and prevalence of disease outcomes, but also certainly people that are having disease, even though they're in that lower range. So what does this mean? Why am I talking to you about hypertension as a neurology audience um, and why should we care? Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a bit about blood pressure and dementia, what we, what we knew then, and then really shifting to the, how that changes given the SPRINT trial and the SPRINT MIND trial and how those really changed our, our evaluation of evidence and what we should do for patients. And then finally, what these new guidelines, newer guidelines and what these new studies mean for dementia prevention. And finally, I really wanna focus a little bit on this concept. The title of my talk was the highs, lows, and in-betweens, that, that not everyone probably should be treated the same way and probably not at every point in their lives the same way. So to talk a bit about the data that I've worked on in this area, I want to tell you a bit about the ARIC study. So ARIC is the Atherosclerosis Risk in Communities cohort. It's a cohort of four community cohort study of four communities in the U.S. You can see here um, there's one in Forsyth County near Winston-Salem um, in North Carolina, near nearish to you guys, um, Washington, Washington County, which is Western Maryland, suburban Minneapolis and Jackson, Mississippi. And you can see here that we have We've now completed eight in-person visits, but the data I'm gonna be talking about today really focus on seven in-person visits. People have been followed since the late 1980s when they were 45 to 64 years of age. We've now followed them for over 30 years. Um, and you can see the numbers, well, actually, I'm sorry, I don't have the total number here for the total cohort, but there were 15,792 original adults in the cohort. And then cognitive assessment was started with a brief set of cognitive measures at visits two, and four, and starting at visit five, which is really when I got involved in the study, we started doing a much more detailed neuropsych assessment with a long battery, with informant interviews, with expert adjudication of MCI and dementia. And that has continued in subsequent visits, visit six and seven. Eight was a 2020 visit, which was three months of which were in person until March of 2020, when we had to make a quick shift to, to do virtual. And now we're back in the clinic seeing people some more. Um, but you can see they've gone from a middle-aged population to an aging population. Now they're 80 to 100 years of age. In addition to cognitive assessments over time, which again became more detailed in later visits, we have brain MRI in a subset. And I'll talk briefly about the Florbetapir PET, um, which was an ancillary study that I ran in a subset of non-demented people from three of those four US communities. So in the ARIC study, because we have this long duration of follow-up, we can really look at longitudinal change in cognition. So in this study, um, with the analyses led by Andrea Schneider, who um, now, who at the time was an MD-PH student at Hopkins, then a resident, then a neurocritical care fellow, now is faculty at UPenn, um, we looked at change in, in cognitive status over 20 years in relationship with midlife hypertension. And I'm going to give you some data showing how important midlife is. When we look at later life blood pressure, it's much less important for cognitive change or cognitive performance, but really midlife and probably even earlier is especially important for cognitive trajectories. So in this study, we looked at these repeated cognitive tests. I told you we had a shorter cognitive battery at visits two and four. This was delayed word recall, digit symbol substitution and word fluency. We repeated that at multiple points. In later years, we have a more detailed battery. We, had, we assessed, um, we evaluated for possible um, attrition and bias and incorporated these into our analyses. And for this, um, we looked at, this was before the newer hypertension guidelines. So we looked at hypertension, pre-hypertension or normal blood pressure by the old JNC7 criteria. And then with this new JNC8 data on indication for treatment, we looked at that as well, but that's not really the focus. So what I wanna show you, these are showing the amount of cognitive change over 20 years compared to people who had no hypertension. So the reference group being normal blood pressure. So pre-hypertension, which is now sort of the stage one hypertension by new definitions, um, you can see here all of these being negative, meaning there's a greater amount of decline over 20 years in people who had both pre-hypertension or hypertension, more so for hypertension than pre-hypertension, than did people with, with normal blood pressure. And so you have about a six and a half percent greater decline over 20 years than you would have had from aging alone if you have hypertension, for example. 
And just to show you what these look like linearly, it's a fairly linear relationship with blood pressure in that higher blood pressure in, middle, in midlife, greater amount of cognitive decline. You can see things get a little imprecise here. This is systolic blood pressure and difference in the global Z-score, which is an average of those three tests over time, simply because people who had a blood pressure of 170 systolic in midlife, there were many fewer of them that survived to have 20 years of follow-up, um, as you might as might, might be expected given competing risks, et cetera, and other causes of, of hypertension-related disease. So what about dementia? Cognitive change is certainly interesting. It's not a huge amount of difference and sometimes hard to interpret what that means in a public health standpoint. So dementia is something that people understand much more. They're much more fearful of um, when we talk to them about potential sequelae of high blood pressure and other vascular risk factors. Um, this, this paper, also from the ARIC study, looked at a number of vascular risk factors in midlife. I'm going to mostly talk about the hypertension results here. And just to share, this is the entire cohort. So we have the entire cohort who we followed, um, and we defined dementia in several different ways. We have people who came in for that visit five detailed neuropsych assessment, informant interview, had an expert adjudication of their of their co cognitive status um, as to whether they were normal MCI or dementia. Um, then we have people who couldn't come in, but we did a phone-based cognitive assessment or who couldn't even do that, but we talked to their family members. And then finally, we included cases that we identified through hospitalization codes. We really didn't wanna miss anyone um, in terms of dementia cases. This again was the sort of old definitions of hypertension with hypertension being above 140 systolic or above 90 diastolic or on medications. And then prehypertension we looked at as well um, with these old definitions of prehypertension. And we have a Cox proportional hazards model here. So to show you the blood pressure results, and again, we looked at this is independent of other vascular risk factors, because certainly you may ask all of these vascular risk factors co-occur. People who have high blood pressure often are also diabetic, are older, et cetera. We've adjusted for all of those. Certainly it's an observational study, so there could be some unmeasured confounding. But what we can see here longitudinally is that people who have high blood pressure or prehypertension have higher risk of incident dementia over 25 years. So not a massive risk, but if you think about the number of people in the population who are affected and each has a 40% higher risk, if you have hypertension, it really affects many people. Um, I do want to point out that we don't really see a big difference in the effect in black versus white adults. In other words, Black adults with hypertension have a similar increased risk of, of dementia as do white adults with hypertension. Keep in mind that this doesn't account for degree of control of hypertension, which we know is really an important, one of the important reasons um, potentially behind some of the disparities that we see in both stroke, but also dementia. So um, this, in this paper in ARIC, we looked specifically at these new criteria and said, okay, there's these new ACC AHA criteria. Again, not super new, but a few years old as of now. Um, how does this change relationships with dementia? Are there suddenly, particularly because these are people who probably weren't treated, does this change how we think about risk of dementia? And the short answer is no. So basically this is using old criteria risk of dementia over time based on hypertension. And this is using the new criteria, which again is basically the old plus more and shows a very similar risk. And population attributable risks from hypertension remain similar regardless of which set of criteria you use. Um, and you can just see sort of incidence rates, numbers, 6.7% of hypertensives that have, have um, 6.7 per thousand person years had dementia versus 6.2. Um, by the other definition per thousand person years. So very similar estimates, both important, both meaningfully showing a relationship with dementia. In this particular study, we tried to address the question as well as we could, which is what about treatment of, of, of hypertension? In observational studies, this is a very tricky question. So in the first paper that I showed you, where I showed you 20 year cognitive trajectories, we saw that this, the amount of decline was a little bit less in people who were on meds versus those who weren't. But it's tricky because people who take medications are different than people who don't. So there's this con potential confounding by indication that we have to think about. So in this particular study, we tried to address this with a number of, of methodologic approaches, but really did a meta-analysis, and this was led by G. Ding and Lenore from Lenore Launer's group, at, who's at the NIA, and combined a bunch of studies and said, let's look across studies, number one, to see if there's an effect of antihypertensive medication use among people with hypertension, 
or in the general public. And then two, if there's certain medications that have a, a particular benefit. And so these are the, the cohorts that were combined, as you can see, ARIC, um, which is why I was involved in some of these other really important cohort studies. And this is a pooled analysis using individual level data. And again, a busy slide with a lot of medications listed. And there certainly have been hypotheses about specific medications, particularly in the renin and angiotensin system as, as potentially having a role. Other studies suggesting, cal suggesting calcium channel blockers may have a particular role. But what we found here is that it didn't really matter what you were on, but in general, and with the pooled data, people who were on medications had lower risk of dementia than those who didn't among people with hypertension. So this is important. If you look at people with high blood pressure, being on a medication was protective. The reason I say it's important is because being on a medication is often otherwise an indicator that you have hypertension. Um, so that might actually demonstrate a, an increased risk because of the hypertension that was there in the first place. But in this particular study, when we looked at people with normal blood pressure, there was no difference in whether you were on medications or not. But in people who were hypertensive, clearly reduced risk of dementia if you were on a medication and it didn't really matter which one. So I mentioned earlier that, that we did not see a difference in ARIC on the relationship between um, hypertension and dementia by race. Um, but I alluded to the fact that, that we know there's differences in control of blood pressure by race for a number of different reasons related to social determinants, access to healthcare, et cetera. Um, but we know um, that this is really an important driver for a lot of the disparities in stroke and dementia. And in this particular study, Deb Levine at the University of Michigan led this consortium where she pooled data from several cohorts, including ARIC, and looked to see if the observed difference in cognitive status and cognitive change over time, which was steeper in blacks than in whites. So you can see in general sort of change in slope over cognition. This is the effect of race, black versus white participants, was more decline in blacks versus whites. But when she accounted for blood pressure control, so actual blood pressure values and medication use, that difference in slope went away. So this was a significant difference, meaning blacks had greater decline in cognition over time. But when you accounted for blood pressure and its control, that difference went away, suggesting that many of those disparities that we see as we hypothesized, are really due to differences in blood pressure control. So what about the actual implications of having high blood pressure? So it can be related to cognitive change. It can be related to dementia. What does this mean mechanistically? Is it a target that's really important to, to get at early? Or is it just sort of another marker of people that are, that are going to have bad outcomes? So to try to understand whether the relationship between high blood pressure and other vascular risk factors with dementia, and even in some studies, Alzheimer's type dementia was due to a direct relationship with Alzheimer's type neuropathology. I conducted this study um, where we did, we, as an ancillary study to ARIC, we did fluorbetapyr PET imaging. So fluorbetapyr PET, as I'm sure you all know, um, is an amyloid PET marker. Um, it's, uh, we know that amyloid is not definitive, uh, is not the definition of Alzheimer's disease, but certainly is an important marker of it. Um, and by leading hypotheses is an important player in the pathogenesis of AD. Um, so we looked at, at amyloid in people who did not have dementia in the ARIC cohort. So we had 346 people without dementia from three of the sites who were 70 to 90 years of age. And we looked at the relationship between their vascular risk factors in middle age and amyloid deposition in their brains, again, non-demented people. And again, we're trying to get at, is, it there, is there a direct link with Alzheimer's type neuropathology, which could be mechanistically leading to this change in dementia, or is it simply that having both contributes poorly to your cognition? So what we found is that if, and this is not for hypertension in particular, but if you looked at odds of having elevated amyloid based on number of vascular risk factors in middle age, you can see here that there's nearly a tripling of odds of having amyloid if you had two or more vascular risk factors in middle age. And again, we count, we count these as hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and smoking. So if you had at least two of those in midlife, and we couldn't look at even higher numbers because again, we had survivorship issues with people that had more risk factors in middle age didn't really survive to these later visits. Um, if you had two or more of those risk factors in midlife, you had nearly a tripling of your odds of having amyloid in your brain in later life, independent of demographics and these other risk factors. And interestingly, and we sort of see a dose response, nearly a doubling if you had one risk factor compared to none. 
And as you get closer and closer to late life, so visit one here is midlife. As you get closer and closer to late life, that effect seems to go away. Emphasizing this point that I made earlier that midlife appears to be especially important for risk for hypertension, but also these other vascular risk factors. And interestingly for hypertension in particular, you can see here that there's a suggestion that the relationship between hypertension and amyloid in later life is especially important in people who are carriers of an APOE E4 allele. So the relationship between blood pressure and SUVR, which is our measure of amyloid deposition by fluorobetapyr, is basically flat unless you have one or two APOE E4 alleles. So this is the interaction was not significant, so not an emphasis of this paper, but provocative in terms of thinking about a two-hit type of um, hypothesis here, where having both an increased genetic risk and being exposed to a vascular risk factor may really increase your risk of these bad outcomes. I mentioned that we're interested not only in how vascular risk and blood pressure affects amyloid, but how those together affect cognition. And I hypothesized that if you had both, if you had both high blood pressure and other elevated vascular risk, and you had elevated amyloid, that these would interact to further increase your risk of worse cognition. And what we found in this paper that's um, about to be under submission, um, so these are unpublished data, is that they did not interact. We did not find evidence of a significant multiplicative interaction between amyloid level and vascular risk factors, but we did find that they both independently contributed to cognitive status. So this is looking at midlife vascular risk, so hypertension, for example, at, at visit one, amyloid at visit five, and how those both contribute to change in cognitive status from visit five to six new dementia cases. And there were 36 new dementia cases, not huge numbers in this subset of 300 people that had amyloid PET and that had all these data for this follow-up. Um, but interestingly, we see that hypertension independently contributes to that incident dementia risk in late life. In other words, visit five to six new dementia cases, as does amyloid. They're both independent of each other, which further suggests that even though they don't interact, you can't ultimately treat this disease by just getting at one versus the other. When we do have sort of... Um, medications that we all agree are reliable and effective um, for amyloid removal or whatever it is that, um, that makes a difference in AD, it may be that we also have to act on these other markers and these other risk factors like hypertension. So other than the data that I've shown you, is there biological evidence that this might be a reasonable relationship, that hypertension might really do something important for, for Alzheimer's disease in particular? And the answer is yes. Um, so there's some great theoretical work, some of which is done by Koss Iadacola at Cornell, um, a lot of work suggesting that there's differences both in blood flow, which can affect health of the white matter of the brain, that's not surprising, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, and that the neurovascular unit may lead to further amyloid deposition, which in turn could lead to further damage of the neurovascular unit and worsening blood flow. And then finally, there's this, not finally, there's a lot of different potential hypotheses, but this concept that the lymphatic system around the blood vessels may be impaired in the setting of vascular risk, which may reduce the ability to remove brain waste. Um, we published a review on this um, in Lancet Neurology in the last couple of months, led by Priya Palta, um, who is at Columbia now, um, previously at UNC and before that at Hopkins. Um, and uh, looking at the ways in which high blood pressure in particular can affect dementia and Alzheimer's risk. And here she just gets at some of, in this particular figure, um, both the mechanistic processes in terms of inflammation, changes in blood brain, blood brain barrier function, et cetera, but also directly thinking about hypertension can cause stroke, which can cause problems with cognition and potentially even Alzheimer's. Hypertension can certainly cause small vessel disease, et cetera. I'm not focusing on that today, um, but certainly there's a lot of interesting data pointing to some of these mechanisms. Um, in general, in addition to the biological physiologic evidence that there might be a relationship between these, we know from autopsy studies that there's a huge amount of overlap between AD and vascular pathologies. So most patients who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease have some coexistent vascular changes in the brain. In these important studies from Ross Mapp, led by Julie Schneider and colleagues, where they looked at people who had a clinical diagnosis of MCI or probable Alzheimer's disease before they died, they found that a relatively small proportion of them actually had a pure AD pathology. So you can't probably see the details of this pie here, but this blue, um, sorry, this light blue is pure AD, 
and these other these other pieces of the pie include infarcts as well as other pathologies. So really, it's very common for people to have mixed pathology. It goes up with age with some kind of vascular pathology in people who have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and therefore, we really need to think about both mechanisms when thinking about preventing dementia. I mentioned that midlife is really important, and I think that um, we need to think about that in terms of how to prevent this disease and when to prevent this disease. It's known that Alzheimer's has a really long preclinical period, which is part of the reason therapeutics have not been successful to date. If the ship has already sailed, it may be too late to make a difference in some of these um, neurodegenerative processes. But we know that vascular risk in particular is appealing because not only is it associated, is it something we know how to treat and we know how to do something about, but it starts early, it's risk, is, is greatest when we look at it from, from midlife or, or even earlier. So this makes it even more appealing as a possible way to prevent some of the changes in AD. So as a modification of the famous Jack curve, you can see here that it's been hypothesized. These are changes in, in amyloid and tau, depending on how you measure them and eventual cognitive status. It's been hypothesized that vascular dysregulation and vascular problems may even precede some of these changes, maybe the first change that occurs, which really makes them very appealing as a prevention target. The, the potential of hypertension as a way to reduce cases of dementia and AD in particular has not escaped public health um, agencies and organizations. So the Lancet Commission uh, put out a, a refresher to their prior Lancet Commission on prevention of dementia. So 2020 was the most recent um, recommendations that they made. And you can see here, this is a beautiful chart emphasizing not only what the risk factors are and what their potential, each of these percentages is percent reduction in dementia prevalence if we eliminated that risk factor. Elimination is very hard, but certainly reducing that risk factor would be really valuable. But what I really like about this figure is it shows the whole life course. I've told you about the importance of midlife. You can see here, hypertension is listed here in midlife. That's when it's really important to think about it. And other risk factors that are relevant along later parts of the life course, diabetes actually sort of fits in in both of these places, um, but really important to think about that whole life course when we're thinking about prevention. And just to give you some numbers behind these, these are thousands of cases that are estimated to be in 2010 attributable to this risk factor. So 425,000 cases of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease that were attributable to midlife hypertension in the US. And you can see that risk factors together account for a huge proportion and a huge number of Alzheimer's cases worldwide. So as I said, public health initiatives have been excited about this. Um, here's, here's uh, this is from the Lancet Commission focusing on the great number of dementia cases that can be prevented potentially, one in three estimated here. This is an NINDS um, uh, program that they're trying to convince people to control their blood pressure. High blood pressure is even riskier talking about both the risk of stroke, but also dementia. And then the National Academy, um, National Academy has put out um, a document describing preventing cognitive decline and dementia a way forward. This was um, several years ago already and before the SPRINT MIND trial, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And they recommended even then based on the observational data that control of high blood pressure, particularly during midlife, and here they define that as 35 over 65. I was one of the sort of experts reporting for this um, committee's consensus report. And one of the follow-up questions they had for me is, what is midlife? And probably someone, maybe that's one of the questions in the chat. People always ask me that. In Eric, it's 45 to 64, probably 35 to 65 is, is more reasonable. Yes, 65 is rarely midlife, but, um, but maybe by the time <laughs> we're decades ahead from now, it will be. Um, so what about Sprint? So I mentioned that, that things sort of changed when Sprint and Sprint Mind came out. So SPRINT was a trial of intensively controlled blood pressure to standard blood pressure control. Um, and what that meant is that people were randomized to keep their systolic under 120 versus just under 140. It was a large trial of over 9,000 people. There were not people who had had a prior stroke or who were diabetic who were in the study. And the study was stopped early due to clear benefit, strong efficacy signal for cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see here, intensive treatment, the yellow line here, standard treatment, higher cumulative hazard of their composite cardiovascular event, which is listed here, MI, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, death from cardiovascular disease, and also for death from any cause, much less for people who are in the intensive treatment, 
than the standard treatment. Study was stopped early. That's great news. That tells us a lot. That's part of what led to some of these modifications in our definitions of hypertension. Sprint Mind came out in 2019. So I, Sprint, I believe, came out 2018. Sprint Mind in early 2019. Um, same study. The problem is it was sort of the um, less preferred younger sibling of uh, it being the cognitive outcomes of Sprint. So Sprint was stopped early for cardiovascular benefit, but there was this really important secondary outcome, which was to look at probable dementia, which probably didn't quite get enough power to get its outcome. So people only had three and a half years worth of intervention, which is probably not going to be enough for a cognitive outcome. Um, and their primary outcome was probable dementia. And they did not reach statistical significance to see a difference in probable dementia for people who got intensive for standard therapy. But there was a hint that something was there. So MCI, they saw a reduction of 19% in risk of MCI for people who were intensively treated versus standard treatment. And when you looked at the composite of dementia and MCI together, they also saw this 15% reduction in risk of that composite outcome, but they didn't reach their primary outcome. And that's really important. Um, but again, I do want to remind you that this study was stopped early for cardiovascular reasons. In addition, they looked at white matter changes. So I, I alluded to the fact that mechanistically, we think that, that small vessel disease could be one of the mechanisms through which hypertension acts on dementia. Um, and they found evidence that higher blood pressure control, more intensive blood pressure control in sprint mind in a randomized setting was associated with less progression of cerebral small vessel disease, less progression of these white matter changes, but it was a very small difference, but certainly in the direction hypothesized. So why wasn't the study more overwhelmingly positive? Why you know, uh, people were excited about it, but, um, but why didn't it show the, the primary outcome that they focused on? One, perhaps it just simply wasn't long enough. I told you it was stopped early. It probably needed longer follow-up. Two, I've told you that midlife is really the most important time period for blood pressure control. And this study started when people were already older. So that's really potentially problematic. But then also there's this question, could it be that there was an effect, but there were some people who weren't going to have a benefit and it actually had harm. And that might have diluted the effect from the intensive blood pressure lowering. So this brings up sort of the, the final topic I wanna to get to in the last few minutes, which is should everyone be treated to the same new blood pressure thresholds? So interestingly in Sprint Mind, in addition to the finding that I showed you about MCI and combined MCI and dementia, they looked at cognitive change. So I, I told you and Eric how cognitive change was a nice way to look at relationship with high blood pressure, but they don't see a difference in the study with specific cognitive tests over time and relationship with intensive versus standard treatment. In other words, it might've changed the threshold for dementia, but we don't see an actual objective change in cognitive data. Even though the diagnoses were done in an objective way, the actual cognitive change did not fit with those two categories, intensive versus standard. In addition, although the white matter hyperintensities progressed less, there was actually more brain volume loss in people who were on the intensive versus standard treatment. So particularly in regions like the hippocampus, there was more atrophy over follow-up in people who were on intensive versus standard treatment. So this is potentially concerning and certainly something that we need to understand more about. There were a few studies looking at, at who might be um, at risk for bad outcomes from SPRINT. And, and these are studies not looking in, at dementia in particular, but I think are really relevant to think about. Um, so in this particular study, they said, you know what, if we, if we implement blood pressure treatment guidelines based on SPRINT, we would prevent 107,500 deaths per year. But by the way, we'd have 56,000 more episodes of hypotension, 34,000 episodes of syncope, 43,000 electrolyte disorders, 88,000 acute kidney injury cases compared with standard therapy. So this is, this is more to describe what the potential consequences are, but realizing that there is always a flip side. Um, in SPRINT, they did not find many adverse events, um, but it was a clinical trial population and not necessarily a real world population. Um, so something important to think about. This is an interesting way to approach this question. Are there certain people who would not do as well with intensive blood pressure control? And this is sort of a risk calculator where basically you can say, what do I know about this person? What are their other risk factors? And what's their risk of, of benefit from being on intensive blood pressure uh, treatment versus harm? Um, and so this is kind of a cool way to think about, you know, showing here, so age, different factors, smoking, creatinine, et cetera. These are people who are higher risk for higher harm 
from being intensively controlled versus not. And what I want to point out is that we don't know where people with dementia, small vessel disease, post-stroke, where they fit in in this algorithm. So is low blood pressure always better? Specific scenarios where it might not be, and I'm keeping an eye on the time because I know we're running short, um, just to briefly talk about some scenarios where it might not be, in addition to what I alluded to more broadly in the general population. So Andrea Rawlings, um, when she was at Hopkins, led this work looking at orthostatic hypotension in midlife, people who had orthostasis in midlife. And again, that's not very common in middle age. This is even excluding people with Parkinson's or on Parkinson's meds. Um, she found that there was a higher risk of stroke, dementia, cognitive decline in people who had incident, who had, I'm sorry, orthostatic hypotension in middle age. This was independent of other vascular risk factors, including blood pressure itself, which tends to be higher in these people. Um, Melinda Power, who's now a faculty at George Washington University, um, but did this as a postdoc with me, looked at blood pressure over the life course and how it relates to brain volumes. And what she found was that not only was high blood pressure important for smaller brain volumes in later life, going along with one of these mechanisms by which hypertension can act on dementia, but if you had a pattern of high blood pressure in earlier life and then hypotension in later life, there were smaller brain volumes observed, particularly in the temporal lobe. Um, so this is something you know, that we need to think about as we think about changes in management over the life course, particularly if you have someone who suddenly is defined as being in a new hypertension category, and therefore we have to um, think about how best to treat them when there's suddenly a new criteria or suddenly they're in a new guideline category. Keenan Walker, um, who's now at NIA, was also a postdoc with me at Hopkins, led this beautiful work looking at change in blood pressure patterns and dementia risk. Um, and what he did, just to, let me get straight to the data, is he looked at midlife and late life blood pressure. And he found that people who were hypertensive in midlife, but hypotensive in late life, had the greatest risk of dementia, this blue line here. If you were hypertensive consistently, your risk was really still quite high. We know that from other studies, um, but really it was this hyper followed by hypo. And the hypo people are below 90 over 60, so they're quite, they're reasonably low. Interestingly, most of them happen to be on antihypertensive medications. We know that they could have, certainly we can't fully account for things like heart failure and other reasons why they may be especially hypotensive, which could contribute to this risk. Um, we excluded anyone who had any early cognitive changes to make sure it wasn't a reverse causation situation. Um, but really this pattern of high followed by low blood pressure seemed to be especially important for risk of dementia. Um, the other, the other point I wanna make about thinking about who you should treat and at what point in their time course is that probably midlife might be too late. So if someone has high blood pressure at an even younger age, we really need to think about the impact that might have. In this British birth cohort study, they found that, that, young, that uh, early adulthood, um, which was sort of in the 30s basically, um, so <laughs> adulthood um, was associated, blood pressure at that stage was associated with lower brain volumes later in life and, and worse cognitive status. So emphasizing that we might need to even shift our, our threshold for when we start treating to an even earlier age. So um, to wrap up, so apparently I learned this was a trip that we took um, pre-pandemic, certainly it feels like an eternity ago um, on safari in Zimbabwe, which was phenomenal. Um, and I, I took this picture of this giraffe after learning from our safari guide who seemed to, who knew everything, that giraffes have the highest blood pressure of any animal um, because they have to be able to pump blood up to their, up to their brains, which is far away from the rest of their body. So, um, Certainly, I don't know about dementia risk in giraffes, but perhaps this is something we need to, we need to worry about. Um, but I suspect that high blood pressure may cause them other problems along the way. So in conclusion, hypertension in general is bad. Lower blood pressure seems to be better. We have evidence that this lower goal is appropriate. Um, we know that high blood pressure is bad, not only for cardiovascular endpoints, but also with cognitive outcomes, such as cognitive decline and dementia. Sprint tells us that aggressive blood pressure control improves outcomes and maybe even reduces MCI and dementia, but we need to keep in mind that that study was not positive for its primary outcome. But the caveat here is there may be some people who don't benefit as much, who might have diluted that effect in sprint mind perhaps, but also who are potentially even at risk of harm from intensively controlling their blood pressure. So thinking about what someone's comorbidities are, thinking about what their life course exposure to blood pressure medications was, and thinking about their auto-regulatory curve, um, and I realized I rushed through a slide that had a picture of it on it, 
people that have chronic hypertension shift their autoregulatory curve. So the threshold below which they experience ischemia is going to be higher than it would be in someone else. So thinking about an individual's exposure to blood pressure is really important in thinking about how best to treat people. Um, in the future, I hope to continue to look at some of these important issues involving hypertension, what it means for Alzheimer's, what it means for some of these other biomarkers, such as blood-based biomarkers um, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, in addition, thinking about who these populations are who might have adverse sequelae for cognition as well as other end organ injury um, from high blood pressure control. We're doing these additional ARIC visits. Um, I mentioned the, the sort of half virtual, half in-person visit, visit eight, we visit nine ongoing. We're doing another thousand MRI and uh, floor beta peer PET scans for, for a number of related hypotheses. Um, and I think we're gonna have a lot of exciting data as we continue to look longitudinally in those people. And then finally, I, I mentioned that we don't really know whether people with progressive small vessel disease or even early cognitive changes are at especially high risk for aggressively controlling their blood pressure. Um, again, you wanna control it to avoid those outcomes, but once they have them, what should we do with those patients? I think that's an important population to understand more about how aggressively we should be controlling blood pressure in. Um, and I hope to study those in more detail. Here's some of my acknowledgements. I have um, absolutely fabulous um, colleagues who, uh, I want to thank here um, and many people that probably are not mentioned here and certainly Eric participants and staff um, and my prior funding sources from when I was at, at Hopkins and now certainly the NINDS intramural research program um, and my lab who have been uh, with us in times when we could all be together and then mask, Zoom, et cetera. But um, I work with a fabulous group of people and trainees um, and with that I will take some questions. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing so I can see everyone. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, if any people have questions, just either put your name or your question in the chat and we'll get to you. So uh, Rebecca, what do I do about this patient? They're in clinic, their blood pressure is 180 over 90, and yet they tell me their blood pressure is always great at home. Is that, what do we do with people like that? Yeah, well, well so I'm not a cardiologist. I only play one on Zoom, but... Um, uh, yeah, so they have to check their blood pressure at other times, but, but certainly there's evidence that even white coat hypertension is indicative of elevated risk, um, you know, partially because there are other situations where their blood pressure is, is fluctuating or they have more blood pressure variability, which I didn't really talk about, but is another important aspect that we know there's relationships between blood pressure variability and a lot of these cognitive outcomes in dementia. Um, but yeah, no, they probably have actual hypertension and probably need some management to, to get um, treated for that. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering about uh, nocturnal dippers versus non-dippers, you know, especially patients with things like sleep apnea where their blood pressure doesn't get lower overnight. Do you consider that to be a higher risk than people who have higher blood pressure during the day, but, but it still dips at night? So, so it's certainly a higher risk than people who don't, uh, you know, I, I, there is evidence that, that that population is at especially high risk for cognitive outcomes, whether it's higher risk than people who are hypertensive all day, but have a more regular nocturnal pattern, we don't know necessarily. The reality is they often go hand in hand, you know, people that um, have high blood pressure may have worse blood pressure variability, but, um, but they haven't been compared directly as far as I know. Um, but certainly, you know, you mentioned sleep apnea, Sleep apnea independently is, is an important risk factor. We're studying that in a, in a, co, in a study within the ARIC study to understand sort of midlife sleep and how that relates to amyloid and dementia. But um, so there's other consequences of sleep apnea in addition to alterations in, in blood pressure patterns. Um, but it's an important point is that there's other things that we're not measuring. And I see there's another question in the chat about spot blood pressures. Um, you know, it's, it's not an ideal to fully capture what's happening in people. There are some studies looking at ambulatory blood pressure monitoring as a way both to assess um, variability, but also um, to understand uh, sort of time averaged, you know, people's blood pressures over time. Um, and, uh, and that certainly is one potential way to understand more about how blood pressure really relates to these cognitive outcomes. It's harder to do in a 16,000 person study, um, but um, certainly in, in smaller studies, there's, there is value for doing more ambulatory monitoring. Wayne? Well, thanks to Dr. Goldson for a great talk, but I'm getting scared. I'm middle-aged, stroke doc. I want the doctor to actually have a wider code 
hypertension. When I put on my white coat, my blood pressure just go up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my question is, uh, you have one slide shows uh, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and they all independent associated with the uh, was it risk of dementia. Um, uh, but they are they, they don't have addictive effect. Um, uh, I just a little struggle with uh, with this because uh, in my view, dementia is some sort of like a stroke. It's a complication, uh, uh, but it's well known. In, you know those risk factors are independent, also have addict addictive effect uh, to the risk of stroke. But why it you know they show different effect on a risk of dementia is it because the diagnosis of dementia is a little bit soft as compared to stroke? Um, so I, I don't, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that they're, they don't have an additive effect. They're, so they're independent in that even beyond, you know, hypertension is important, independent of also having diabetes. Um, we haven't looked at some of these specific interactions, meaning if you have both hypertension and diabetes, if there's a multiplicative interaction, um, but I will sort of point out the data from the ARIC PET study where I showed you number of vascular risk factors and amyloid deposition. We clearly showed there that the more that you had, it didn't matter which ones they were, the more you had, the higher your risk of amyloid um, in later life. So I do suspect that, that it is similar to stroke in that the greater the burden, the worse off you are. Um, in that particular study, we didn't look at all the different permutations of interactions, but looked at them to see if they were independently um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't um, also a potential interaction between them. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Burnett. Hi, uh, so my, my question is related to, uh, I saw that the risk factor for physical inactivity seemed to be a fairly high uh, uh, factor for uh, later cognition decline. So I was just wondering if children uh, are inactive, do they stay inactive in adulthood? And therefore, should we really be working early, early to make sure that they uh, don't have this risk factor. So it's the point in general about getting at kids when they're young is a, is a great one. Um, there is um, a fair amount, I mentioned both the British birth cohort study that showed earlier before midlife was important. There, there's a, the Young Finn study is a really nice study in Finland where they looked at children and vascular risk factor and health status. In other words, how, how well they met sort of recommendations, both about physical activity and hypertension, those kinds of things, and found even in children that there was a relationship between some of those early markers of how, how ideal their cardiovascular health was and cognition at a, not in midlife and not meeting dementia criteria, but at a later time point. Um, however, I don't actually know, I suspect that people who are, who are experts in physical activity may know whether inactivity in childhood relates to inactivity in adulthood. My guess would be yes, but I don't actually know those data. But what I do know <laughs> is that there's, there's, first of all, there's great potential in sort of linking some of these childhood cohorts with these adult cohorts and understanding how early life uh, health decisions in children and adolescents make a difference not only in cognition in midlife, but how that again affects um, dementia later, risk for dementia later. I mean, I think I think in general we know that the our youth are are not um, generally following recommendations in terms of life, lifestyle, physical activity, other other health parameters, um, and we know that they have other major consequences, which themselves are risk factors for, for cognitive decline and dementia. But I don't know about the specific link between um, inactivity at different time points. My, my guess is that they probably are, have been described as being linked, but I don't know that for sure. All right, uh, Andy, why don't you take us home here? All right, so uh, it's actually two questions. The, uh, one of them is the biomarkers. Are you looking at PTAL because it typically correlates better with cognitive decline? And I don't know if that's a future study for you as well. It is, so, um, so Priya Palta, who I mentioned who's at Columbia has a um, K99 now R00, where she's measuring um, the blood-based biomarkers, including PTAL um, uh, in uh, people who have imaging at visit five. She's doing it at two time points, sort of earlier and later. Um, and that's gonna be really exciting. And I certainly have other plans to measure some of those, those biomarkers. Um, and we've talked about doing tau imaging as well in this cohort, haven't gotten to it yet, but it's certainly something that, that we've talked about, but you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's an important point that that's another valuable marker, understanding both disease stage and um, risk of disease, but also understanding more there's some 
cost iaticola has some nice evidence looking at hypertension in tau um, so other other important relationships worth um, pursuing and then the last one is uh, kind of more of uh, race and ethnicity is that uh, the African-American population has uh, two times the risk of dementia, and but they uh, all have the vascular risk factors. And is that the reason that they develop dementia uh, much earlier um, and uh, at a much higher prevalence? So, so partially, yes. So certainly we know that risk factors are not only more prevalent. So even if hypertension has the same effect on dementia, it's more common and less well controlled mm -hmm. because of structural racism and things that have affected the way that blood pressure is monitored, treated, um, et cetera, access to healthy diet, um, et cetera. Um, but in addition, we have some interesting data in ARIC PET where amyloid levels are higher in black than in white participants in ARIC. Um, and we have some new data that we're just writing up, which suggests that if we really dig deep and account for some markers of socioeconomic status beyond mm -hmm education, which is sort of what we've had available before, but more, more um, life course exposures of socioeconomic status that we may be able to eliminate that apparent difference in race in the biomarker level, um, which again would go along with the fact that it's all these other factors that affect, that affect disparities. I do want to point out, you know, a lot of these social determinants lead to changes in biology, right? So yeah. if you have, exactly. um, so, yeah. so hypertension may be more prevalent, that's true biologic finding, even if it's caused by social determinants that led to that difference in the first Absolutely. place. Yeah. It's all related. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks. All right, everybody. Well, Rebecca, great as always. Um, and good luck in your new job there. It's a tough job, and but they really picked the right person for it. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for having me in. Thanks, right, everyone, everybody. for your questions. Be safe.